Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, is America's most prolific serial killer. So named because his first five victims were found dead along the Green River in Washington State. Between killing his first victim in 1982 and his capture in 2001, he murdered at least 49 women, most of them prostitutes or teenage runaways. During interrogation, after his arrest, Ridgway admitted to more than 70 murders, though many of these remain unconfirmed. I'm now going to cover 21 creepy and terrifying details about the Green River Killer. Number 21, Gary Ridgway, the family man. Gary Ridgway was married three times. At the time of his arrest, he and his wife lived a respectable life in a quiet area where his neighbors thought of him as a stand-up guy. Ridgway also had a son and would sometimes show pictures of his son to prostitutes to put them at ease before he murdered them. Number 20. He found choking his victims rewarding. As is expected from a serial killer, pathological liar and necrophiliac, Gary Ridgway has said some extremely creepy things. A sampling of his sinister one-liners. I don't know if it was an illness or just a... I wanted to kill. My method's working pretty good. Choking is what I did, and I was pretty good at it. And, they look in the bedrooms, nobody's in there. Nothing's, you know. There's my son's room. Hey, this guy has a son. He's not gonna hurt anybody. He preferred choking to other forms of murder because that was more personal and rewarding than to shoot her. Number 19. Ridgway went camping with his son. In 1984, Ridgway took a camping trip to Oregon, south of his home in Washington, with his son, who also happened to have the remains of two or three dead prostitutes in his car. He paid for everything in cash to leave no record of the trip and dumped the remains in the Oregon area so as to make detectives think the Green River was moving south. He then presumably had a nice camping trip with his son. Number 18. He targeted forgotten women. Ridgway intentionally targeted women he knew the police wouldn't spend too much time getting worked up about. In a way, his crimes tell us as much about our value system as a society as they do about his warped mind. He said, I picked prostitutes because I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. He also focused on underage runaways and other forgotten women. Number 17. He was a cheapskate. As you would expect from his crimes, the Green River Killer hated prostitutes. But maybe not for the reasons you'd think. He said, I picked prostitutes as my victims because I hate most prostitutes and I did not want to have to pay for sex. Mark Prothero, Ridgway's lawyer, had the following to say, I came up with the term psychofrugopath. He was cheap to the psychopathic degree. When you would ask him why he would kill the girls, he would say because he would want to get his money back. Number 16. He was really weird. It's easy to see these things in retrospect, but Ridgway was always a kind of weird where you know something isn't quite right about him. For example, after six months of questioning, David Reichart, the head detective in the Green River Killer case, asked Ridgway if he had any questions. Ridgway responded, Yeah, how come your hair is grey and your eyebrows are dark? Number 15. Ted Bundy tried to help find Ridgway. After seeing a newspaper picture of Detective Dave Reichart, the lead officer in the Green River Killer case, Ted Bundy wrote him a letter offering assistance in finding the killer. Ted Bundy, the rapist, serial killer, and necrophiliac. In his letter to Reichardt, Bundy wrote, don't ask me why I believe I'm an expert in this area, just accept that I am, and we'll start from there. Reichardt took Bundy up on his offer in 1986, but it got him nowhere. Number 14, he stayed eerily calm. In his typically blood-chilling, nonchalant manner, the Green River Killer 
explained to detectives why one of his victims was found without a head, saying the head probably rolled the rest of the way down the hill as the body decomposed. He killed so many women, he was fuzzy on the details of this particular murder, offering, I picked her up someplace and went to the house and killed her, most likely. Number 13. He openly admits he can't be trusted. Ridgway is the first one to tell you he can't be trusted. When interrogated by the police, he openly admitted to being a pathological liar, said journalist Charles Hager of Ridgway. Gary Ridgway is absolutely playing me. He's playing everybody when he talks. I don't think Gary Ridgway can even comprehend the truth. Number 12. Ridgway stayed out of prison for decades. The Green River Killer claimed the vast majority of victims in 1982 to 1983. He was arrested on a prostitution charge in 82 and became a suspect in the case, but was released after passing a polygraph test. It wasn't until 2001 that police compiled enough DNA evidence to arrest Ridgway. At the time, he was living peacefully with his third wife. He began divorce proceedings pretty quickly. Number 11. He seemed like the perfect neighbour. Charlie Harger is the first journalist to speak directly with the Green River Killer. Of his encounter with the killer, Harger said, The strange thing about Gary Ridgway is that if you didn't know the depravity, if you didn't know the evil this man committed, you would have no clue about when you talk to him on the phone. This man seemed like the perfect neighbour. Number 10. He joined a single parents group to meet women. In the early 80s, as Ridgway killed dozens of prostitutes, he would also attend meetings of parents without partners. The organisation was designed for single parents as an easy way for them to meet like-minded people with similar interests. In 1984, he was even engaged to marry someone from within this group, but she left him for someone else. Number 9. He didn't want to step on anyone else's toe. During the intense period of questioning with the police, Ridgway made it clear he didn't want to take credit for all the murders he committed, but very explicitly stated, more than once, that he didn't want to take credit for murders someone else committed. When asked why, he replied, well if it's not mine, because I have pride in, in what I do, I don't want to take it from anyone else. Number 8. Ridgway practiced his moves on his wife. Ridgway's second wife, Marsha Winslow, divorced him in 1981, a year before his prolific killing spree began. His relationship with her sounds a bit like a trial run for his subsequent crimes. She attests to his love of bondage, admits he choked her, and tells of having sex with Ridgway outside by the Green River. On outdoor walks, Ridgway would also walk away from her into the woods, then sneak up behind her to surprise her. Winslow also attests that Ridgway would practice walking silently so he could more easily sneak up on her. Number seven, he may have killed as a teenager. Gary Ridgway has two very distinct memories of assaulting people in his youth. Though admitted, he can't remember whether these things actually happened. In one memory, he drowns another boy in a lake. As it turns out, two boys drowned in that lake when Ridgway was growing up. It was never confirmed whether either was his victim. In another memory, Ridgway, aged 16, stabbed a much younger boy in the woods. The boy survived and escaped, though Ridgway was never arrested for the crime. According to some accounts, this actually happened, and both Ridgway and the victim recall Gary laughing and saying, I was always wondered what it was like to kill as he walked away from the scene of the crime. Number 6. His mother was seriously creepy. Mary Ridgway, Gary's mum, was a serious creep. Gary was a chronic bedwetter, and whenever he wet the sheets, Mary gave him a cold shower, barely clothed herself, and spent a particularly long time washing Gary's private parts. She would also regale her young son with stories of measuring men for suits at department store where she worked, providing ample detail of the smell of crotches and how they would get aroused when she touched them. Number five, he wanted to sleep with his mother, then injure her. Ridgway admitted to having sexual fantasies about his mother as a teenager. Specifically, 
He wanted to have violent sex with her, then slit her throat with a kitchen knife. His goal was to scar her neck for life. Apparently, he envisaged a superficial throat slitting because he felt he could never live up to her expectations. Number four. He referred teenagers to older victims. Most of Ridgeway's victims were teenagers and he preferred his women young. In his own words, they were less likely to try to con him than older women. Explaining further, Ridgeway said, I talked to them before I had sex with them and she'll say, I've only done this a few times before. I mean, if she's 13 or 14 years old, you figure that's true. If you get one that's 20 and 25 that talks a slang, and everything and they say I've done this only a few times and they've probably got an arrest record and they're lying but the young ones stood out more when they talked when they were dying number three Ridgway asked his victims to use the bathroom before sex when you're dying you become incontinent as Ridgway quickly learned after his first few victims to avoid that mess Ridgway asked the prostitutes he picked up to empty their bladders before he took them to bed, since he planned on murdering them immediately after sex. Number two, his father never stood up to his mother. Mary Ridgway was as violent with her husband as she was inappropriately sexual with her son. She would scream at her husband and attack him, but she provoked little, if any, response. One of her many habits was breaking plates over her husband's head, only had to have him stand up and walk out of the room without saying anything. Number one, he practiced necrophilia. Over time, Ridgway lost his ability to be aroused by a living person. So he would kill his victims, then have sex with them, while their corpses were still warm. When he first began practicing necrophilia, Ridgway buried his victims close to his home, so he could return to them, dig them up, and have sex with them again, if the urge struck. Of course, by his own admission, he would have to wipe away maggots before having sex with the bodies. Ridgway eventually became disgusted with his own sexual fantasies and practices, and so he tried to wean himself off the practice of returning to the buried corpses for sex. He began disposing of the remains far enough from the house there would be a major inconvenience to return to them.